The documentary about our favorite Jedi, Obi-Wan Kenobi, A Jedi's Return, is very much appreciated. But let's be honest, any loyal fan will have been able to dig most of them up on their own accord. Still, the documentary is an important milestone for both fans and the legendary Jedi, so we just can't help ourselves. Here are five fun things we learned from Disney's Obi-Wan Kenobi documentary. First up, Ewan McGregor himself chose Obi-Wan's lightsaber for The Phantom Menace. This isn't really a secret, and we knew this before the release of Obi-Wan Kenobi, A Jedi's Return, but it's still a nice little nugget that was put in the documentary. So, in case you missed the tweet that Star Wars sent out in the world back in May, McGregor tells the tale of the day he was allowed to choose Obi-Wan's lightsaber hilt in the documentary once again. It was before the production on Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. He recalls how he went to the department that takes care of all the props, where the prop master, Brad Elliott, was waiting for him with a wooden box. And when he opened up the box, a whole set of lightsabers was revealed, and McGregor was given the honor to choose one himself. In the end, prop master Elliott and his amazing team designed designed a hybrid lightsaber hilt for the Jedi, with features from both Alec Guinness's lightsaber in Episode 4 A New Hope and McGregor's lightsaber from Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith. The result is nothing less than stunning, and it's nice to learn that McGregor himself was involved in the making of this iconic piece of artwork. Because let's face it, it's art, don't you think? Following, Ewan McGregor thought that the submarine in The Phantom Menace was really going underwater. Ewan McGregor had another core memory from his days on the set of Episode 1 The Phantom Menace. Remember the Gungan Bongo submarine that Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon Jinn, and Jar Jar Binks used to travel from Otogunga to Thede, McGregor was so impressed with it that he thought they were actually going to submerge it in water for filming. He was having a stroll around the studio with George Lucas when they came upon the stage where the crew was working hard to build the impressive submarine, where McGregor would end up together with Liam Neeson and Ahmed Best. McGregor took a moment to take it all in, and apparently the crew was doing such an amazing job with making it as realistic as possible that he couldn't help but believing that the thing would actually be able to tread water. But just to make sure, he asked Lucas whether his hopes and dreams would become reality. Unfortunately, Lucas had to burst McGregor's adorable bubble and had to remind the actor that he was actually on a set. And on a set, no matter how good of a job the prop team does, it's still all just make-believe. So if they had fooled you as well, don't worry, McGregor thought the submarine was real as well, and he got to see it up close. Next, Deborah Chow drew inspiration from her own father. Obi-Wan Kenobi gives us a part of the story that we've never been part of before, and that's the depiction of the relationship between Obi-Wan Kenobi himself and Princess Leia, who is portrayed by the lovely Vivian Lyra Blair. And for director Deborah Chow, it was this key element that drew her to the project, and ultimately, it was the deciding factor that made her step aboard. As she explains herself, her father was a very pivotal person for her. He was a huge movie fan, and he was Chinese, which is how she ended up seeing a lot of Asian action movies. I think I absorbed a lot from that, and just the speed and the imagination that a lot of the Asian martial arts have, and the legacy of people like Akira Kurosawa, and the Grandmasters, Jet Li, all the people like that. It's certainly inspiring to hear that Chow was able to pull so much from so close to home. No matter what your heritage is or where your roots may lie, being able to draw from it can be the deciding factor in many endeavors, and we can confidently say that Chow did an amazing job balancing her unique view, which in turn will be a huge inspiration for many generations to come. Hey, hold up, we've got more in store for you. We did promise five fun things, didn't we? And do you want to know a secret? We may even have put a bonus in here as well. But to find out what that could be, you'll have to keep watching until the end of the video. Now, ready for the next part? Let's go. First up, Kumail Nanjiani's wall smash was probably a little too enthusiastic. In Obi-Wan Kenobi, there's a moment where Inquisitor Reba, who's portrayed by the amazing Moses Ingram, uses the force to throw the con man Haja Estri, played by the very talented Kumail Nanjiani, against a Dayu wall in order to effectively interrogate him. His goal? Find out where Princess Leia and Obi-Wan Kenobi are hiding out. And of course, we expect the scene to look spectacular on screen, but we also know that, in the end, it's all fake. But looking at the behind the scenes of that particular scene, it looks like the actor may have gotten a little more than he had bargained for. I got forced pushed into a wall much harder than I thought I was going to. I'm very padded up and it was awesome, but I also forget what day it is, says Nanjiani about the moment in question. And now you know why that moment looked so freakishly convincing. And now, Hayden Christensen knows Obi-Wan had the higher ground. One of the most delightful highlights of the Obi-Wan Kenobi documentary is the fact we get to see a reunion between Hayden Christensen and Ewan McGregor, 17 years post-shooting Revenge of the Sith. And, just so you know, 20 years since the iconic duo first met on the set of Attack of the Clones. In Episode 5, we get to see McGregor and Christensen rehearsing the flashback lightsaber duel scene, where Obi-Wan and Anakin are training together with their mullet and Padawan braid reaffixed, respectively, as if no time at all has passed, instead of a whole 17 years. We also get to see the duo reflect on their experiences on set, including the day that Christensen returned to his Jedi robes for his first shot in Episode 3. That's the moment when Obi-Wan sees an apparition of Anakin in the desert of Mapuzo, after having learned 
that he's alive and well as Darth Vader. Apparently, the crew had a hard time getting rid of McGregor when he was done shooting for the day, because he insisted on staying around to be there for Christensen's first shot back. McGregor would not allow the crew to send him away, and stubbornly took his place by the camera for Christensen's eyeline. It was a very emotional thing, Christensen says, not just reuniting as these characters, but also as friends. It was like going back in time, and in true documentary fashion, we get to see the pair stand next to each other as they're watching the duel from Revenge of the Sith, when Christensen says that McGregor had warned him about the outcome, and McGregor, he wished he'd gotten a dollar for every time someone had told him that he had the higher ground. Bonus, Deborah Chow is the first woman and first person of Asian descent to both direct and executive produce a series. Naturally, the making of documentary for Obi-Wan Kenobi at Jedi's Return focuses on its star and legend, Ewan McGregor, but there is someone else who gets some deserved attention, and that's the director and executive producer, Deborah Chow. Normally in movies, the director is who has the veto power over the project, but in television, it's the executive producer. This is because a series is made continually, often with different directors coming in for different episodes. But Chow has become the ultimate combo breaker by becoming the sovereign over the complete Obi-Wan Kenobi series. And in the behind-the-scenes clips, it's blatantly clear that she is always in the absolute thick of it. Obi-Wan Kenobi is a triumph for Chow, and A Jedi's Return artfully highlights this. We really wanted to select a director who is able to explore both the quiet determination and rich mystique of Obi-Wan in a way that folds seamlessly into the Star Wars saga, Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy said. And we'd say they did an excellent job in choosing Chow, who obviously had all the skills needed to bring all those important elements together. And now, Deborah Chow is officially the first woman ever and first person of Asian descent ever to both direct and executive produce a series. And let's not forget that, previously, the Star Wars behind-the-scenes world was predominantly in general. And though the documentary focuses appropriately on its star, Obi-Wan, the achievements of this extraordinary woman are an important message of the documentary as well, one that should not be overlooked or forgotten. And that's all we've got for now. What part of the documentary stood out the most for you? Let us know in the comments what your thoughts are, and thanks for watching.